track of that. Did you win? Did you lose? What's a letdown? What's a celebration? And I think one of the most important findings in the last few years in neuroscience is that while the molecule dopamine is associated with reward, it's more about motivation and craving. There's a really classic experiment now that people use to uh, demonstrate this. Take two rats and the rats independently, separate cages, can lever press for food uh, or and they can access food. There's a little bit of dopamine that's released anytime they get some food. So we always thought that food, uh, like many other rewards, uh, like food, sex, warmth when you're cold, cool when you're too warm, is triggering the release of dopamine. But someone had the good idea to deplete dopamine in one of those animals. And then what you find is that the animal without dopamine still enjoys food, still enjoys other pleasures. So dopamine's not really involved in the enjoyment of those pleasures, it's involved in motivation because if you make the animal have to move just one rat's length, believe it or not, to get to that lever, the animal with dopamine will work to go get that thing. It will work through some effort to go get the reward. Whereas the animal, or it turns out the human without much dopamine, can still experience pleasure. They can sit on their couch and cram their face with pleasure-inducing calories or what have you watch pleasure inducing things on the television, but they have very little motivation to go pursue things that will deliver them pleasure. So when I say dopamine is the universal currency of everything, what I mean is it's driving the motivation to develop new currencies. When somebody can sit back and say, uh, I'll just throw this number out. Let's say somebody has a hundred thousand Bitcoins, which presumably now is worth oh my a God. Good, good amount, <laughs> certainly more than it was a few years ago. The way they can register whether or not they are in a position of wealth or not, has everything to do with the, the number they see on the screen or in their Bitcoin wallet. But that number is converted into a chemical signal that has everything to do with how much you had previously. So, the, so. so we could talk about the so-called reward prediction error, how good you feel with an experience has everything to do with how much you had previously. And dopamine itself is what's driving the human species to create these new technologies. And so while we think of currencies as the goal, it's actually what's really driven the forward evolution of our, our species has been the desire to go seek things beyond the confines of our skin. And when I say the common currency is dopamine, what I mean is the molecule dopamine when secreted in the brain makes us pursue things, build things, create things, makes us want new things that we don't currently already have. And so it has a lot of dimensions to it, but rather than think about dopamine as a signal for reward, like a dopamine hit, we classically mm. think to talk about it. It's more accurate really to think about dopamine as driving motivation and craving to go seek rewards. That's the rat experiment. And it's a way of tabulating where we are in our life. Are we doing well or are we doing poorly? And that happens on very short time scales. Like do you wake up feeling good or do you wake up feeling kind of low or on long time scales? If you're halfway through a long degree or you're halfway through your life, how are you doing? How do you gauge that? Well, it has everything to do with how much dopamine you were releasing in the previous days and weeks and years. So you're always comparing it and all of this is subconscious. But what's cool is that once you make these processes conscious, once you understand a little bit about how dopamine is released and how it changes our perspective and our behavior, then you can actually work with it. So it's one of the um, instances where knowledge of knowledge actually turns out to be a really useful tool. Dude, that's crazy to me. So one of the things that I get hit up about all the time is people feel stuck. And as you like really push on them to, to figure out why they feel stuck, they'll be like, yeah, I wanna do that. And, but I just, you know, I can't get out of bed or I don't have the energy to pursue it or whatever. And you get into this common thing that people say in mindset, and I really believe it, but I find it far more interesting when you're talking about it from a neurochemical standpoint, which is you just don't want it badly enough. And when I think about my own life, I, I sometimes worry that I'm either more malleable than other people or that I have a greater ability to manipulate my dopamine release or whatever because I'm very good at building desire and I like the way that desire feels. Now, when you use the word hunger, I think people get confused because I actually don't enjoy being hungry for food. I find that totally unpleasurable. However, 
Being hungry for sex, I find incredibly, I feel alive, I feel focused, I feel energized, I feel aggressive. It's complex for sure, but I find that feeling, incre the, the act of wanting something in the future, in, in that kind or in business and trying to build something. I feel, in fact, woof, that's an interesting insight into my own self about, I like to build. And do we know, so we, dopamine is the neurochemistry of the pursuit of making sure that I have the energy to go, but do we know how we can spike that? Well, first of all, it's clear to me based on your description that you've tapped into these uh, channels that release dopamine because craving and wanting, whether or not it's sex or, or uh, money or connection, or anything, all right, uh, is that's the, the primary trigger for dopamine release. Yep. Now, sex and reproduction makes the most sense from the perspective of evolution. Uh, I mean, any species, every species has, tends to have two primary goals. One, protect its young, and second, make more of itself, mm. usually in reverse order, right? <laughs> uh, so even for people that don't want children, I mean, you might not, uh, or people, of course, uh, not everyone is having sex just to reproduce, but at a primordial level, that's what those circuits are there for. So every species, in particular mammalian species, where there's a lot of parenting and caretaking of the young, tries to take make more of itself. And everything that you see, like maternal aggression, which is a powerful circuit that gets activated after uh, females of any species, in particular mammals, give birth, they will fight to the death and they gain superhuman strength in order to protect their young. That's a, there's a known circuit for that in the brain that gets activated once a female has offspring. Female brain? I have not. Oh my God. So I just probably lost a lot of points by No, 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 that. but you're, <laughs> one, it'll be super interesting because you'll know if she's on the right track from a neuroscience perspective. I remember reading the book. At the time, I thought I was gonna have kids. And I remember thinking, whoa, like this book chronicles what happens to a woman's brain and how things change. And I was like, when you have kids, man, you are inviting a neurochemical change in your significant other that is gonna play itself out in a very real way. Mm -hmm. And I'd be lying if I said that wasn't one of the things, one of the many things, but one of the things that I factored into not having kids. Interesting. Uh, and then the same with menopause, that it's this really dramatic sort of reorganizing might not be the right word, but that it, it has real implications in the way that the person moves, just mm -hmm. as the decline of testosterone has in men. Well, in, on, a, um, on the positive side, uh, during pregnancy, the woman's hippocampus, her brain area associated with memory and retention of information, it goes through a period in which it gets worse for certain types of information, but then achieves superior levels of working memory once the babies arrive because there are a lot of things to manage. So this makes sense. This is true in rodents. This is true in humans. And then in terms of the uh, biology of the father, we now know that when, because typically parents have, uh, you know, it does seem like one spouse always does more than the other. Um, but even in the most uh, evenly divided households, uh, the there's usually some co-parenting of some sort, but that the father has a big increase in the hormone prolactin mm. when the mother is expecting and the prolactin lays down body fat, it prepares for sleepless nights. For women, it, it, it sparks um, the circuitry for milk letdown for, for nursing. Um, so the dad bod has a lot to do with prolactin. This is true in, in birds, in small mammals, and in humans. And this is now, been, there was a paper published in Nature on humans specifically about this. And when you think about the relationship between dopamine and prolactin, it's, it's interesting and it takes us back to this motivation and craving that, that you were describing earlier, which is that dopamine and prolactin work in, in opposite fashion. So the, the most salient example of this is sex and reproduction where anticipation of sex and reproduction greatly increases dopamine, but post reproductive, post sex, it doesn't have to be for reproduction, there's a spark in prolactin in the male. The, the spike, excuse me, in prolactin. And that spike in prolactin is actually what sets the refractory period during which he can't mate again. So it sets a period of Damn. quiescence to keep men, in, it's for pair bonding, for the exchange of chemicals through the nose, through the, through the skin and through the sweat, mainly through odor. Uh, the, we could talk about pheromones if you want, but that's a topic that's somewhat controversial. The, the actual identity of pheromones in humans has not been identified, but there are pheromone effects in humans. It's controversial in that people don't agree what's really happening. Well, okay, so th there's this, culture of biologists that have clearly identified pheromone effects in other, in non-humans. 